Good evening and welcome to the University of Leicester. My name is Henrietta O'Connor and I'm the PVC and Head of the College of Social Science, Arts and Humanities. I'm delighted to have been asked to introduce Professor Athena Karajo Yayani's inaugural lecture today and to welcome you all. A benefit of being virtual is that people are able to attend wherever they are and it's a pleasure to see so many of you have logged in. I'd particularly like to welcome Athena's friends and family who will know a great deal about her work, not least because she describes them as having to put up with her obsession with work, but they may not have often, if ever, had the pleasure of hearing her present her work in this way. Today's event is an important part of the university's centenary celebrations. In October this year, we celebrated the 100th birthday of the University of Leicester. A hundred years ago marked the start of our story and legacy as a university to honour those who made sacrifices during the Great War. Thank you for joining us to mark this historic milestone and to celebrate the new chapter in Athena's career. Having said that, she was actually promoted to chair over two years ago, but the pandemic has of course delayed many events and this inaugural is no exception. It's wonderful to finally be able to formally celebrate her career in this way. Athena began her academic journey as an undergraduate studying politics and international relations at Lancaster University. She went on to do a master's degree in international conflict analysis at the University of Kent and then to Nottingham where she did her PhD in politics. She joined the University of Leicester in 2014 and her research has gone from strength to strength. She's published widely and has secured prestigious grant income. She's widely recognised as a leading expert in her field on digital technologies and their socio-political impact. I was delighted to learn that recently Athena has been appointed as an expert advisor to the government as a member of the Department of Culture, Media and Sports College of Experts. Those who follow Athena on social media will understand when I say, Athena, you are spoiling us with your amazing work and we look forward to being spoilt more by your lecture this evening. I'll now hand over to Professor Peter Lunt, who will provide a more detailed overview of Athena's academic contribution and introduce her lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Henrietta. It's my great pleasure on behalf of the School of Media, Communication and Sociology here at the University of Leicester to introduce Athena's inaugural lecture, through which we celebrate her becoming a professor, the highest rank in an academic career reflecting years of commitment and excellence in research. Athena's research focuses on the interrelationship between digital media, networks of resistance and global politics. This combination of media, social movements or civic participation and politics has a long history. Before the advent of digital media, politics were often confronted by social movements and civic participation, bringing governments to account and demanding rights and social justice in the life political movements of the 1960s and 70s, seeking voice and recognition through the politics of identity. However, such movements were hard work, painfully slow and often ineffective. And in contrast, digital and social media appeared to offer the potential for a radical expansion, expansion of the potent, potency of digital activism by radically expanding access to potential activists, enabling the organisation of protests in an exciting, disruptive and volatile environment. In her book, Firebrands of Digital Activism, Athena sees this initial conflagration of digital activism as epitomised by the Arab Spring as the high point of optimism for the transformation of politics. Partly in response to 9-11 and the Snowden affair, governments around the world co-opted the very technologies that had galvanised revolting surveillance, social control, and cyber conflict. In her lecture today, Time is the New Oil, Consciousness, Temporality and Ideology in the Post-Human Capitalism, Athena reflects on our current conjuncture in the relationship between politics, subjectivity and environmental protest against the backdrop of a geopolitical arms race in AI, the role of ICTs in the governance of the human and the non-human, and asks where this leaves political subjectivity and the potential for collective action. So I now invite Athena to present her lecture, Time is the New Oil. Athena. Uh, thank you, Harrietta, and thank you, Peter, for the wonderful uh, introduction. Um, uh, what I'd like to do first uh, is uh, run you through, like perhaps uh, some of how we got here, 
at the beginning and then talk about where I think we are with this and where I might be going. So in, uh, in relation to uh, the development of technology, I'm interested more, not, not so much on the digital development and where things are in that respect, although that is fascinating, uh, more on the political effects and socio-political impact. So, um, as, uh, as Peter mentioned uh, uh, in my book, uh, uh, A Fire on the Ways of Digital Activism, I, I, I go through various phases of digital activism, uh, starting with 1994, uh, with the uh, free libre open source movement. Um, then we have the first time we have uh, the Zapatistas uh, struggle in, uh, in Chiapas in Mexico, the, the struggle, the guerrilla warfare moves to cyber in 1994. Then you have Seattle in the media, the, the globalization, global justice movement 1999. And this is the first time we have live streaming of a protest and, and you have other examples, of course, uh, the, the Strada overthrow, but via mobile phone use in 2001. And then in China, you have the, the, the realization from the government that you cannot open economically without actually looking at what's happening uh, with uh, protest mobilization is organized with the internet. And the, of course, the example is the Falun Gong organizing protest uh, in China in 1999. Now, in, in the, the rise, what we would say the rise, the second phase between 2001-2007, you have uh, the critical event of 9-11, uh, the Al-Qaeda network attack uh, and the use of these networks. Uh, uh, the scholarship starts talking about cyber-terrorism at that point. And then you have a critical war, uh, the Iraq war as the first internal war. Um, is, is dubbed the first internal war, where you see uh, the crackdown on civil liberty, securitization, and military aspects there. And also, you see anti, anti Iraq war mobilizations, the digital impact on work coverage, related cyber conflicts, pro Islamism, Islamic hackers, pro war, anti war uh, mobilizations, both online and offline. And then, and then you have you, the Ukraine's Orange Revolution, 2004 or 5, activism during, for example, the Republic Convention, where you see uh, also um, in parallel a new forms of civil, uh, uh, civil disobedience. And then the, the use of ICT to organize and replace leaders for Al Qaeda and organize them during a London attacks where you see the use of ICTs uh, in various ways. Of course, many scholars have written about what I'm talking about, and I, we ha and I, and, um, and I think uh, the research there is, is plenty and complementary uh, to, to some of the research I have done as well. So you have the continuing resistance in China, you have the, the Lebanon War in 2006, where we look at how these technologies can give away positions of uh, military, uh, and then you have the my, my personal favorite, the Estonian Cyber Conflict 2007, where you, you start looking at whether um, a cyber attack that amounts to physical attack. Now, from 2008, we enter a phase where you have the spread, let's say the spread, you have the Obama elections were significant, where you have crowd, the use of crowdfunding, uh, for the first, like, for well, not the, the first time, obviously, but the significant political campaign, and you have political participation blends then with digital activism, grassroots activism, and then you have in other, um, in other countries, the Green Movement after the 2009 elections in Iran to overthrow Ahmadinejad, the crackdown. Uh, on the population. A significant event in 2010, the Google China incident, where famously Hillary Clinton says it is the, this, this um, companies, they have to promote democracy. And we arrived like slowly, I think, um, not forgetting the Sidagma Square and that the austerity protest move that starts 2009-2010 um, in, in Greece as well. We enter a period um, uh, like right before the Arab Spring, or was it a spring? I mean, it's a, lo a long discussion, really. But the significant event in the area and my, my contribution there in relation to WikiLeaks and the collateral damage video, which was released in the summer of 2010. I was releasing my son at the time I was giving birth, so I was like uh, very eager to get back to work at that point. Um, so then uh, from then on, after the Arab Spring, let's say, uh, revolutions. You have uh, Occupy Wall Street 2011, right? And and that goes all, all the we have like abstract assemblage, the abstract assemblage of the Occupy Wall Street movement with concrete 
um, assemblages around the world, uh, and 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 some of these draw on pre-existing at globalization um, uh, efforts and in the media, the in the media network, and so on. And then what we see in that period, because of course, oh, how can you forget there's a financial crisis that becomes an economic crisis, political crisis, cultural crisis, social crisis, and so on. And you have the anti-austerity movements, and this is where a lot of the, from the Arab Spring onwards in the anti-austerity movements, you have a lot of boom in the, in the scholarship in relation to how it is, uh, 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 and a, a lot of optimism, which, which basically crashes, I would say, in particular, the first time it crashes, because there are scholars uh, that have talked about uh, the social media paradox, right? The fact that you have enterprise association platforms that are built for enterprise association, but you actually do civic participation all that. That's the heart of the paradox there. For example, uh, we should nationalize um, these platforms. Uh, in 2012, Herd Lovin talked about that, or the Net Delusion 2011, uh, Evgeny Morozov. So, and at the, the 2013, I think this is uh, the important kind of uh, moment in some respects, because you have the Snowden affair, where you have the revelations that you have a, a, a meta, metadata structural acquisition uh, between five countries, the five eyes, where they can all spy on their own population, so they spy on the other population and the special relationship between the NSA and the GCHQ and so on. Now, that op techno optimism uh, that uh, that was uh, like in, in the public domain, at least not in the scholarship, uh, uh, or like the experts are not actually very optimistic at that point. They're talking about privacy, so they're talking about the business model of various uh, tech platforms. Um, and in 2016, uh, you have uh, something that I've uh, lived through here. You have Brexit. And, and and you have also the US elections at the same time. So people are started talking about hacking democracy and, and whether these um, this, this, uh, social media uh, platforms are, are, are um, well, I would, I would say personally, there are more expressive causes, other than efficient causes, but in any case, you have the scandals of 2018. And this is then when in the public, super public, let's say, imagination have a Facebook data breach and the Cambridge Analytica, a scandal where you have um, uh, an opening and the Cambridge Analytica data sets includes, excludes usernames, hometowns, educational histories, religious affiliations and so on. And you have uh, companies, uh, you have uh, scientists that work in neuropsychology involved. You have famously Alexander Kogan, who wanted to be known as the Spectre. That is true story. You can Google that. And then you have, so you have like this moment in 2018 where all that was going on in the scholarship and, and in some of the journalistic cir cir uh, circles comes out as, as, as a big problem, basically, of what is going on. And, and more revelations of that period uh, in, revolve around Brexit and the vote leave and believe uh, Brexit scandal, uh, where you have vote leave spending millions of pounds buying targeted advertising through ag aggregate IQ during the referendum campaign. And then after they reach the seven uh, million spending limit, uh, they 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 form another uh, organization of vote leave as a youth arm and donate another 625,000. And this is where you have very young people involved that didn't know what was going on. Uh, you have whistleblowers, of course, I guess of a while that, that comes out with all this story and various others. Now by by that time i think and and this is a year before the pandemic in 2019 in particular you have over 80 uh, or more protests around the world right and 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 what you get uh in this kind of uh reasoning and where the scholarship is uh, up to that point is discussing um how digital politics whether digital networks are an alternative means of inclusion in democratic society there's a lot of that being discussed, whether it enhances civic engagement and political identity, whether it amplifies an event, but does it actually sustain long-term impact? Uh, so the day-to-day -day use of uh, these this social media networks um, does not result in a long and sustained political participation. Uh, you have uh, questions around eco chambers, filter bubbles effect and the rest, where you have affected polarization um, occurring, and then you have um, the, the continuous, because you have to say from the mid 90s, that was the uh, serious questions about the socioeconomic status, how, how the, the, the division of socioeconomic status leads to a digital divide. Uh, 
Uh, and also from the Arab Spring in particular, I think the state strategy in terminating movements. So the, the questions um, were about whether you self-communicate and self-express, but does it actually, is the, is, are these social media networks conducive to collective action? Does it empower social movements? Yes, but it might also promote individualized politics. Um, and it also promotes weak tie relationships and strong, uh, strong tie ones. Organizations of protest mobilization might be built, but, but, if, but most of the time, uh, what happens is there's a tactical freeze that they're not going anywhere uh, in the sense of the you know, pink hats, anti protest for Trump or whatever, where you have um, that protest against Trump with the pink hats um, uh, was actually. Um, organized in 48 hours. Now, if you look at, back at the, at the Iraq war mobilizations, it took them six months. If you look back at uh, the anti-Vietnam protests, it took four years. So you can see one of the issues here is how it accelerates mobilization, but does it sustain collective action? And th this is one of the, of the issues. And whether also it has direct impact on political engagement, does it mean uh, that, okay, there's individual citizen self-expression, but does it actually impact political engagement? So these were some of, of the questions. Meanwhile, uh, from the 2013, there's not the revelations all, onwards, although I would say also um, the Assange, uh, uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks 2010, you have a political uh, atmosphere that is uh, that that movements and protest organizations um, uh, mobilize against what they see as a quasi totalitarianism. We made that argument where you have an, a, a weird, let's say, not weird, rather than a monopoly, rather of digital planning uh, on surveillance resting on backstyle, a secret communication between government, tech, corporate elites, and sometimes NGOs that are funded by, by, by corporates or governments. And, and what is the role? I mean, we're looking at the role of civil society and NGOs as mechanisms for circumventing the democratic process as well, uh, depending on how they're funded. And, and then becomes the question whether the funding, like funding actually dictates or not uh, uh, ideo uh, ideological uh, uh, elements and strategies and tactics, etc. And then you have an unprecedented scope in the form of, of, of the, the, the structural data acquisition by Western intelligence matrices. And, and that has um, an impact in how, for example, um, uh, journalists can actually work with sources if, if, if the sources are not feeling confident that they're going to be protected because there is surveillance. And, and also the persecution uh, of, of journalists and whistleblowers and transparency actors uh, that are outside um, the scope of civil society groups. Now, this is, uh, uh, I hope, uh, uh, kind of like a, a rich overview of all this, uh, this hundreds, well, hundreds, yeah, literally, of articles and books written about what I, I just talked about, uh, and they're quite easy to follow. Now, having said all that, um, the what I want to talk about today is um, this general um, techno-utopianism that, that concerns data and uh, data activism and data subjects and data that is going to uh, be uh, a solution uh, to quantify uh, spatial and temporal trends, to identify eco-risks for policy interventions. Uh, well, well, at the same time, what you have there is an artificial intelligence technology uh, that uh, that can be equally uh, employed for the biopolitical management of human and non-human populations. And in the context of uh, where we are now, which is a pandemic crisis and an ecological disaster around the corner and so on. Now, in regards to artificial intelligence, I think what is very interesting, uh, I think the most interesting quote for me comes in, uh, from 1950, 1951, where Alatori said, uh, once the machine thinking method has started, at some stage we'll have to expect the machine will take control. And this is very interesting. So uh, what, what are we talking about? Uh, is it an AI that understands human limitations steps in? Uh, when I, uh, AI comes forward, does it come with human values? Uh, what is this value alignment? So AI ethics is, is quite 
significant and there's a, a whole lot of scholarship, uh, especially in the past 10 years developing there. Uh, do we train the AI to predict what a human would do? Do we punish the AI when it deviates or does it simulate what a human would do? How do you keep humans in the loop, etc.? Although there is a race and, and, and as far as I understand, the race is currently being worn uh, by China in terms of uh, uh, patents and all sorts of things. There is little progress on how we experience human consciousness and, and here I would like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, that there is this uh, this slow progress to understand. I mean, in terms of, I mean, if I hadn't worked in this area, I had to, had to start again. I would actually study neuropsychology because I think it's a fascinating um, a fascinating area of work, and of course there are like, significant developments there. But still, we, we don't we have gaps, right, in, in how human consciousness works. And for me. Uh, this is very important, uh, understanding, because I think that's how we would understand how ideology emerges, emerges from consciousness as well. And, and, and having gone there, I think I need to talk about ideology. And of course, there you have masters of, of the, this discourse, uh, Marx, right? Consciousness is determined by social, historical, economic factors, we call ideology. Um, and then driven beyond the person that does the ideology. Then you have Nietzsche, consciousness is language, worn out, speeds and no longer tells the truth, there's a distortion of the truth. And then you have Freud, um, and, and imagine Freud, right? He could have the Vienna Analytica, right? The So you have Freud, um, then conscious distorts what I'm thinking, etc. And then of course you have Darwin, consciousness biologically, biologically predetermined and so on. Now, Consciousness, does consciousness understand what is saying? Uh, it doesn't understand what is saying, uh, but also it doesn't understand what is coming from. And despite all these problems, right, we understand all too well each other's ideological positions. And this is uh, the very interesting thing, right? And then another, uh, I'm slowly building, right? And like a, my little Lego here. So um, the other interesting thing that, and I think that there is a, a, a transformation of subjectivity that comes through the, the, the constant engagement with the digital. So I'd like to talk a bit about uh, temporality here, what I think is an important concept. Um, so temporality is how the subject catches itself within time. And, and how this temporality, I think temporality helps us clarify subjectivity in relation to our digital engagement. Uh, now, because uh, one of the, of course, <laughs> again, another uh, master of this course, I mean, I know I'm quoting only men here, but so it has happened, sue me. Um, so Heidegger talks about, um, uh, the, talks about, uh the, the factually that the factually it's we're thrown into existence itself in order to reveal temporality and temporality is what makes existence primordial possible and i think that uh, if you look at this movement of temporalization, for example, the flow, as Husserl will actually put it, it's a movement that anticipates itself, a flow that never leaves itself behind. And temporality um we will never understand how a thinking of constituted subject can posit or cut sight of itself within time. Like we will never understand, right? And I think this is important to understand because we have uh, temporality as an imperial temporality, you're, you know, in, in the, the times of empire, you can have temporal exclusions of populations that are not synchronized in, in our digital, you know, like a, a few billion people that are no part of our networks, you have to, can have temporal exclusion. Then you have the, the sovereign uh, temporality, like who is the chronocracy, like that you have sort of a capitalist way of actually doing time. Time is very important in terms of temporal boundaries uh, and how, for instance, just to give a very real world example now, like in real life, if you look at uh, like remote working, which we have been all doing in the past couple of years, uh, you have boundaries, temporal boundaries blurring all the time. And it's not just the private and, and the private and, and, and and the public uh, blurring, the, there is also um, a need in a way to understand how uh, time and space plays out in, in how we work. Um, also, there, there is temporary inequality, 
or uh, otherwise called racial time as well. And you have conflicting temporalities as well. So the local, uh, you know, the local worker like that uh, does gig work, you know, like digital labor issues and so on. So you have this conflicting temporality. So temporality uh, is important. Uh, and, and I want to go back uh, a little bit um, in, into the ideological story here. Um, now, um, okay, bear with me. One of the very interesting, uh, well, how did this come up actually? Because that, that's probably, I would have to explain how this uh, came up, otherwise not going to make any sense. We were researching platform ideologies and and in that research, we're interviewing you know, the classical kind of like the Uber uh, public policy person and the Airbnb public policy person. And they, they were saying, you know, like, or the uh, they were saying what they meant to say that if you put them all on a network, you'll be fine <laughs> because they won't be able to leave. Or, we, you know, the, Airbnb, the Uber person would say that. Or the Airbnb person would say, oh, we want a shared experience, like to, the Airbnb is an experience of, of the whole of uh, where you go, you know, that kind of thing. But then you had like more like alternative kind of um, actors, let's say um, uh, anti-surveillance actors or like commons oriented uh, people that, that argue for more common in, commons oriented pro-commons or, um, or platform cooperativism and so on. And what, what happened there, I think, uh, and what I realized in a way is uh, that you have this intermediate kind of actors that, in a way, um, the, 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 the message that they were giving now, the logical message, was that they were changing, you know, the discourse, but this didn't have effective um, sort of structural effectivity in, in the labor processes and, and how they were managing things. So in a way, I started, th we started, th I started thinking, we started thinking with my collaborator and other people about this false consciousness story, like whether uh, people um, become in a way uh, sort of uh, the, the, the coping by imagining, you know, this change that actually in reality uh, not only does not come, but other workers that they're, they're managing uh, become some collateral damage, right, to, to, to the whole um, platform economy. So because of this false consciousness, I started like rereading, okay, that took a bit of time, uh, look acts on the history of class consciousness. And uh, what was interesting there, um, I mean, he argues that you, you can have a scientifically acceptable solution, right? Um, and it might exist, but this is of no avail because to accept that solution, even a theory, would be tantamount to observe society from a class standpoint other than that of the bourgeoisie. So he's saying, what he's saying is the barrier which converts the class consciousness of the bourgeoisie into false consciousness is objective. So he's talking about the class situation itself. And there was a very interesting thing after uh, reading uh, reading this that I stumbled upon. I mean, it must have been some conference somewhere. I mean, like there was a, no, a lot of travel in, in like in those years. Uh, maybe it was in uh, in Boston. Who knows? Now there was a presentation there. Somebody was talking about um, a, a French theorist that published his thesis in 1962. It was translated in. Um, in English, 1978, uh, and his his name is uh, Gabel, and he wrote uh, a book called "False Consciousness and National Reification." So, what he he did was a very um, interesting combination of the sort of classical Marxist kind of Lukacian approach, but um, combined it with like uh, clinical studies and clinical case studies. So, what he was saying was that. Um, false consciousness is a diffused state of mind. So ideology is a theoretical crystallization of a general justificatory nature. So he's talked about derivation. Now, the, the issue with, with how we do reification, right, and how we understand historical duration becomes really important because what he's arguing is that in the false consciousness, let's say, uh, although consciousness relies on, on, on the split, the schizophrenic split to operate, but in false consciousness, what you have is specialization uh, as an anti-dialectical experience. So there's a crisis of temporalization, right, in how you perceive psychologically. So when you have a crisis of specializing the past, you have, you have far-right ideologies, 
But you also have a crisis in dialectical temporalization of the historically dominant future, where you go to the far left. Now you could argue where will the, the Nazis and all that, because they we're actually looking at the, at the future as well. Uh, but that's another, <laughs> another story because of how um, it wasn't uh, contemporaneous, like temporality in how it worked out there. And I think that might be an explanation for that. In any case, now, Having read Gabriel and all that, I started thinking about the ideologization process, how basically, although you have um, um, uh, how we make ideology, what is the process involved in making ideology, where, where does it come from, right? So, and I started, I started thinking about this, so part of what I think ideologization is, is a process of being in the world, of experiencing, materializing political consciousness. And this is formed by interacting with political, socioeconomic, historical conditions like classically. And, and these then define the political, the collective political unconscious as well. So when you have um, you have this perception of idealization, the next question, right, is okay, you have of course, at once you have this in this interpretation of why like individual internalization and collective production happen at the same time. But then the question then for, for me became how does this pro 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 process <laughs> protest, uh, process happen in relation to digital networks? So from the experience of a research, in the, and that there is no time actually to go into a lot of empirical stuff, although I'd love to, but these are for people to read in papers. I just wanted to talk about this now. Um, sort of my argument is that this planet was impeded at the logization process and they proliferate this planted ideological production. You have, and I'm referring, of course, not to just disinformation, but also like the way um, surveillance accelerates, surveillance capital accelerates. And also the, this rejection, this anti-dialectical kind of stance, right? So the questions I want to ask and I want to find answers for at this point is how does ideology emerge on these networks? Um, uh, so, and, and if it does, how does it communicate? Because the level of accuracy and detail it communicates impacts on forming ideological consciousness. And I think we already uh, in, in a bit of uh, trouble there. Now, digital networks, platform capitalism, okay, so being on digital networks, um, so where does ideology and as individuation of digital networks go badly wrong? Uh, are we humans? Are we puppets? Are we dancers like the song, right? Are we manipulated by these hidden algorithmic forces? So the question here is what, what happens to, to human agency on digital networks, right? And there's a lot of wonderful work there about distributed agency and uh, and multi-scalar uh, processes and, and, you know, like the intersubjectivity and the digital and, and so on. And also there is work that is very interesting on algorithmic governmentality um, and that also looks on the classical disinformation polarization kind of stuff. Um, now, one of the interesting things um, that that emerged from me is like a, a series of problematics that, that relate to um, the platform capitalism as a scenario, right? So the first of those I already kind of talked about is the more philosophical kind of um, story and uh, how um, the material and the expressive structure and superstructure work uh, because the part of the techno op utopianism story was that it took a long time to understand the materiality of comp computation, right? And, and and that was the significant problem that it's not like this fluffy thing, like a, like a, like a limp uh, that is not there, right? And the, that limp, even when we feel it is not there, it has a materiality of its own, 95% of the interest on inter underwater sea cables, right? But no one talks about that or what can go wrong with the ecological uh, kind of uh, story on the impact of digitization and all that kind of stuff. And then you have uh, the structural uh, problematic about how network organizations differ from organized networks, uh, how hierarchical uh, state and uh, state and corporates are hierarchical but network, then um, like uh, mm, <sighs> Jack Tapos uh, against organized networks and that kind of dialectic. And then 
then you enter the organizational problematic, right? So networks versus hierarchies, uh, which networks are really networks and not you know, uh, uh, even if there are networks that here into hierarchy, hi hierarchical uh, us and them kind of um, story, uh, how does this may affect leadership? Uh, there's a lot of scholarship about swarms and rhizomatic structures, and then you have issues about, oh, here's a horizontal movement, right? But, but in there you have crypto hierarchies, um, you have leaderlessness, masking power, and, and you would have um, also, uh, the problem of um, whether networked activity or organization is better than hierarchical forms and, and so on. Now, the third problematic that I think is significant uh, is in relation to a digital labor, I mean, broadly speaking, right, um, in terms of organization, and but also how violence uh, structural violence comes to, come to it, right? Uh, when the movement is dominated by uh, reactive affective structures, um, the, we have like this kind of uh, dialectic as well. You have, and finally, the final uh, um, problematic for me has to do with the orders of descent, ideological orders of descent rather. So where you have the problem of, uh, of uh, let's say, movements that are local, national, international, post-national, and where the labor process is in there, where the type of co agent communicating is there. And, and the fact that, I mean, just to give an example to illustrate, if you think about, I mean, I'm from Greece, right? So if you have a, a protest, anti austerity, anti austerity protest, uh, initially where I guess the corrupt government, you know, like that kind of stuff, but then it jump scaled against the Troika, against international organizations imposing austerity and so on. So you have like that order of descent goes to the international, the post-national. In the case of Occupy, it was in the post-national global kind of um, Assembly Blatzy story. If you look at something like the Arab Spring, what you have is change of regimes, but it stays at the, at the national level most of the time. I mean, we do know that this that there is no liberal structural adjustment programs and all sorts of other reasons about that, that that are relevant to that but the movements were looking at regime change at the national level they were staying there right at that national level they were not anti-capitalist or anything like that so um so kind of to move on from these problematics um when we talk about the post-human capitalism I mean, i'm going in by <laughs> one by one uh, so the post-human capitalism um uh, story, right? Now, I think here, and this is where perhaps the the temporality issue is relevant as well in terms of temporal networks. Now, it, it, it you have okay in in previous sort of more Mar Marxist discourses, you have like oh the mode of production, how you can have parallel modes of production, but now what we have because you have this predictive technology. And, and the combination of different time rhythms, micro temporal, kind of uh, selling, uh, you know, micro targeting, you know, all that kind of stuff, fintech, and, and that happens with AI like really, really fast, right? You have that problem, and then you have the working, um, the dualism between the working time and leisure as well, which is another problem. You don't know where you're working and where you're not working and what you're doing. And, and the other issue that we've got here in terms of the post-human, of course, there's a, there's a scholarship that was celebrated at some point, oh, object-oriented, uh, philosophy and ontology and, and so on. But I think, what, which is very interesting, okay, but what I think this is missing is that right now, right now we have also within with layers of time, and this has to do with uh, multiple temporalities, basically. And if you look at um, the lockdown, which is uh, 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 like almost, uh, I don't want to sound weird, but it was like, uh, uh, what we saw there was the, the halt, right? So you had industries that completely or like almost completely stopped. Another ones that took a, a different life, making billions and billions so for, for sort of uh, certain companies, the Google, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, um, and, and so on. But the, you, you have at the lockdown also is this suspension of time. Um, 
also what you had uh, from particular the, the environmental movement and, and in that sense you have a, a, a whole generation that is uh, mourning in a way of a loss of a future you know like how dare you like you know uh, so you have these other like temporalities entering as well and and also what is interesting and perhaps it, it should be examined i guess and i mean we're all here doing this job whatever we'll get around to it is whether to what extent and and what is the actual transformation happening of how we perceive time and temporality now going into the pandemic because i mean it was inescapable um the what we had before the pandemic uh, we had it and, and the literature, I think, of this information particularly started in 2016 uh, onwards. You have this disinformation architectures, uh, wonderful colleagues working in that area, um, like talk about how disinformation architectures pose risk for populism, radicalism, um, and with algorithmic interference, but sometimes it's actually far more banal than that. And then you have the in relation to AI and the booming in that kind of industry in relation to algorithmic bias and gender, race and class and other kind of uh, bias. And then you have also emerging issues in, in, in employment and health and education and the future of work quantification, recruitment bias, uh, policing, uh, predictive policing and, 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 and all that with really, really great scholarship in terms of data justice, whistleblowing and, and digital rights, data inequality, data activism and, and so on. Now, in, uh, okay, so in, um, in the past two years, I've been involved in, in uh, a few projects. My, my, my main one uh, is called Digigen and it's a Horizon 2020 project. And in that project, we looked at um, ICT information communication technology and civic participation was well, the title of the work package, right? But uh, what really I wanted to see, and, and this is why uh, we also agreed to, to look at uh, movements that were happening during the pandemic and to understand the impact of, of the pandemic in movements, especially uh, where youth and youth activists were involved as well and to look at why they mobilize and how they mobilize using ICT, right? So they're simple questions. Uh, some of the answers um, we looked at, uh, I looked at existential rebellion and Black Lives Matter, particularly because Leicester uh, witnessed a, a massive demonstration um, in June 2020 and and we organized, we met with activists online, of course, because that's uh, uh, what was after after an actual physical mobilization at the Leicester City Centre. But also, we I interviewed um, and, and with the collaborators, we interviewed um, Exisa Rebellion activists and Exisa Rebellion youth activists. And, and that was the work we were doing in the UK. I mean, uh, partners in Estonia were looking at LGBTQ activism um, and Black Lives Matter, which was very interesting because uh, it was unexpected that youth there, and this is why it is interesting when you have a jump scale of an issue and becomes a global trend. You can see a place like Estonia where they have ethnic crosses, nobody has really mobilized for them, you know. But uh, in that case, uh, youth uh, actually grab their imagination. And then in Greece, anti-gender based violence in Greece, uh, this is a serious, uh, significant problem that exacerbated during the pandemic, but also the revelations um, and, and, and so on. I mean, it was like uh, almost 10 years after the Indian uh, um, uh, digital gender activism, if you think about it. So, and then, so what we discovered uh, during um, sort of these interviews was that uh, participants that are active in civil society organizations that are well organized, robustly organized, whether they're decentralized or hierarchical, but they are, uh, they, they use specialized type of platforms. For example, XR uh, also uh, used a Switzer, um, a, 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 like a storage in Switzerland because of their laws that are more protective for movements, but also because they're carbon neutral. So that actually, um, in a way, uh, the, their ideology becomes something that they act on in terms of the impact of, uh, of uh, digitization and so on. Um, so uh, these more organized 
in terms of ICT, but more organized more broadly with innovation in terms of decision making and and using all sorts of platforms and so on, they're more mindful of inter safety and surveillance issue. Now, those that are members of less organized movements, um, then they rely on more commercial and general platforms to organize and communicate, coordinate, publicize activities and so on. And the other thing we discovered is, of course, as it was to be expected, was that when the when the pandemic happened, they, most activities moved online. Um, uh, but uh, what that gave the opportunity for movements to restructure, right? And that, of course, <laughs> uh, uh, that of course created other problems of how quickly can you restructure where your models are, kind of. Um, by consent, decision making, and trying to avoid the model of occupy that you can never the occupy move that you, you get, it's difficult to avoid. Now, um, also that we discovered that in less organized organizations, less organized organization participants rely more on intergenerational mentoring to acquire skills and experience. And a great example of that, I think, is Leicester, where you had very young people uh, going on Twitter, but needing actual help um, to, to, to create a process that would that adhere to the COVID safety rules. And this is where you uh, this where it enters that the, the pre-existing organization, the race organization have a long history in Leicester. This is where you have the mentoring, right? And 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 in relation to acquire from the city council permission to hold uh, political events during a pandemic and so on. So this intergenerational mentoring is really really interesting, and it's not without conflict. Um, and in, in, in relation to more organized settings in particular, uh, for example, the XR youth, XR rebellion youth uh, wants to always be seen autonomous uh, to the existing rebellion main or central. Uh, they occupy the meeting and and so on to to ask for more voice in the movement. Now, the other thing we discovered was that participants that are active and have been active since their adolescent years and the adolescent stories are really particular, uh, particularly important and, and uh, Dai Levine, my colleague, always reminds me about, about how uh, what happens in, in that age. Uh, but uh, the adolescent years, um, the, what plays a, a lot of role is family and overall life world experience. But at the same time, there might be a political event that, that triggers kind of a, of a reaction. And, and that's where you have the most active political participation on these on networks. Um, OK, so um, now I'm like, uh, like trying to come to an end here. Um, so in terms of this the production of temporalities and production of alternate temporalities that you might have seen in my abstract, I don't want to disappoint, so I'll say something about that. Um, now, uh, so there is there uh, some scholarship uh, that argues that where you have uh, more funding, I uh, have more digital bureaucracy forming, and therefore that's why you see uh, that the far right, uh, you know, um, like has a more connection to the masses. So there is like that kind of argument. Um, uh, I, I can't say I agree with that argument, uh, although I, I, I can tell uh, where it is coming from. Um, now, the long standing assumption. Um, is that uh, has been that the left is in perpetual disunity, fragmented, recuperated. Um, there's no feasible vision for a new system. Um, and there's a lot of writing about what happened with Corbyn or what happened with Podemos or Caesar or other kind of uh, left, uh, more left, uh, well, uh, um, organizations. Uh, and whether um, there is a feasible vision uh, to replace current varieties of capitalism. Um, but I think that this kind of assumption does not take into account uh, the significance of temporal practices. And, and this, and I'm particularly talking about those related to um, network internalities and externalities of mobile organization. Uh, what does this mean, network internalities? Uh, very quickly, movements before, and, and Peter alluded to that, they worked for many years to build, you know, what they were doing and to negotiate and so on. Now, when something happens like a flash fund mobilization online, these network internalities and the building of organization 
does not actually have time to happen, right? And and this is a problem because you don't have a law of organization building. Um, uh, so, for instance, you can have a, a wonderful media savvy, um, incredibly uh, social media kind of uh, digital leader that sort of uh, uh, mobilizes people and so on. But that leader is not building an organization. And the effects of that is that you don't have an efficient way of leadership and you don't have an impact on the structure at all. It's just this fluffy like media exercise basically that doesn't come to uh, amount to anything. Um, I won't name names, <laughs> but uh, you, I'm sure you, you're with me what I'm trying to say, or I hope you are. Um, now, the other issue I think that is uh, that's very interesting um, in the last minutes I have is the one of leadership. And, and there was an obsession uh, by in the 60s and 70s, of course, and it was a good obsession, it was a good obsession about uh, participatory leadership, recognizing the work uh, uh, of women in movements of, um, uh, you know, of all sorts of um, different ways of communicating um, uh, by particular groups of people that did not, go, like, did not, uh, that were psychologically different from different class positions, from different cultures to participate in the public discourse, right, and be part of movements effectively that is decentralized leadership would be more inclusive and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, however, what is going on with that is that there is often misapplication of decentralized leadership. And that is a problem because uh, movements are not able to intervene fast when they need to intervene because they have to go through all these processes and, and perhaps like a more dual mode of, of leadership that is not just one thing or the other could actually um, hold the potential for to produce future temporalities essentially which surpass the organization of human life beyond capitalism and if one is interested in that i don't know and in in, in that sense uh, an argument that is interesting like mean, why is leadership different uh because leadership construction intensifies uh, uh because of this algorithm based flows of information and viral activity but but this kind of leadership is highly volatile. So you might have like the public mass following and, and you have jump scaling from the local level to the world life, like mass celebrity kind of thing, but actually you're not building organizations. And, and this is a key issue. And I'm gonna end uh, uh, sort of uh, where I think some wonderful work is going on at the moment. Um, because I mean, many have written about this, about, um, agency and, and radical distribution processes and so on. I think Mark Hanser, Hansen uh, uh, wrote a book that I recently read that I was really excited about, the Feed Forward book, um, where he says 21st century media repress consciousness by rendering it as an emergence generated through the feeding forward of technically gathered data concerning antecedent microtemporal events. And I think it's so beautiful written that I couldn't have written it. I think that um, in relation to this, the, the, the media repressing consciousness, like and feeding forward, I think this is a wonderful way of understanding where subjectivity is transformed here, but also that I think digital networks impede the, impede the ideologization process and the proliferate this plant ideological production, the accelerate surveillance capital. And, and in that sense, what I would like to do in the future is actually look, look at this particular issue like when and how does it emerge ideology how does it emerge in human consciousness in the algorithmic age does it emerge differently um or not or what happens there because i think uh, that is an area that i think is very interesting and it might explain uh some of what is going on uh in terms of polarization uh because the internet and social media networks digital everyday network media they're no longer an element in the structure, right? They are right now in the core of the structure. And because of also uh, coincidentally, because what should have happened in 10 years happened three months because of the pandemic. So I think it is an interesting moment. Um, 
uh, to um, an interesting moment uh, to reflect uh, on all that. Uh, and now I have finished my talk uh, and I invite Henrietta, Professor Henrietta O'Connor um, to close the event. Thank you. Thanks so much, Athena. I don't know how you managed to speak for 45 minutes without slides so eloquently. It was amazing. A wonderful insight to your work and a skillful presentation of your research. You've given us a fascinating account of how ICT is used for democratic purposes, but also increasingly to undermine democracy. Athena's work is such an important corrective to those who view social media as a benign forum for sharing pictures of cats and personal news. Her insights are deep, powerful, and the implications will continue to play out for some time to come. And I think that's what came across really strongly this evening. If we were in normal times, I'd now be able to ask the audience to join me in a huge round of applause to thank Athena for a fantastic lecture. So Athena, please take a moment to visualise and imagine the tremendous round of virtual applause from your audience this evening. I'd also in normal times be able to invite you to join us for a reception and the opportunity to continue the conversation. And I'm sorry that we can't share that this evening. So all that remains is for me to thank Athena again on behalf of all of us here today and to thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Athena.